Hello everyone. We'll be starting in about five minutes. Hello, everybody. We'll be giving everyone a couple more minutes to join as we have a number more people registered who've not yet logged on.
All right, everyone, we're going to get started. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for our influenza and heart disease webinar today. Before getting started officially and introducing our guest speaker, Dr. Jay Udall, I have some housekeeping to review. For those of you who are new to our webinar platform, GoToWebinar, if you have successfully downloaded the GoToWebinar software, you have two options for audio. The first is to listen using your computer speakers. Make sure that they're switched on and that the volume is high enough. The second option is to listen through your phone. The number and access code are below. And when you log in, you'll be prompted to in enter your audio PIN, which is unique to you. That will appear in the GoToWebinar dashboard. A screenshot of what that dashboard looks like is on the right-hand side of my slide. Dr. Udell will be taking questions at the end of the presentation, but throughout the webinar, if you have a question, you can type your question into the chat box at the bottom of the dashboard, as you see on the right-hand side of my slide. Please do not use your phone or computer mic to ask questions. And please note that Dr. Udell will finish his presentation before taking any questions. Please turn off your computer speakers if you're listening or through your phone, if they happen to be near your phone, and make sure that your cell phone is also not located near your phone. This will reduce feedback and improve the listening quality of the presentation. About this session, we're recording, and the recording will be uploaded to our YouTube channel following the presentation. The link to the recording will be sent to all registrants after the webinar. Slides will not be available after the webinar. Along with the link to the recording, we'll be sending a link to an evaluation survey, and we ask that you take the time to fill this out, as the survey will inform future learning opportunities like this. And now to our agenda. Influenza, or the flu, is a respiratory illness caused primarily by the influenza A and B viruses. While most people with influenza recover, severe illness can occur. Some groups are at a greater risk of influenza-related complications, especially those over the age of 65 and those with chronic conditions. It is estimated that influenza causes approximately 12,000 hospitalizations and 3,500 deaths every year in Canada. This session will discuss influenza prevention, its symptoms and risks, particularly for those 65 and older, as well as those with other chronic conditions. The session will also discuss vaccination and its importance, particularly for this population. Now I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Udall. And I ask again, if anyone is on the line, could you please mute your phone if you are listening? Thank you. Dr. Udall is a cardiologist and clinician scientist at Women's College Hospital and the Peter Monk Cardiac Center at the University of Toronto. His work on cardiovascular risk factor identification and therapy has led to publications in the New England Journal of Medicine and Lancet Diabetes, to name a few, and alterations in international cardiovascular practice guidelines. Dr. Udell's research looks at the cardiovascular benefits and risks of diabetes and antiplatelet therapies and other novel therapies, including influenza vaccination. He's a co-principal investigator on a randomized controlled clinical trial known as INVESTED, looking at the cardiovascular benefit of high dose versus standard dose influenza vaccination. And now without further delay, I am pleased to turn it over to Dr. Udell. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, can everyone, I hope, hear me okay? Please chat and let us know um, if you can't. I'm gonna just, just switch over to my PowerPoint and let's see if I can get this right. Um, so I'm also watching as an attendee, so I'm hope, hoping that I can switch it over. So as I think, I see that I'm not switching it over as an attendee, so I'm going to try this again. Uh, get out of this one more time, try again one more time, and see if I can do it. Okay, that worked. Um, Great. So, if I can ask everyone again, just to mute your lines, if uh, if you don't, if you would be so kind as uh, just there's some background noise that we can hear. Uh, oh, then it went again. So, oh, sorry for these technical difficulties. 
Kirsten, we may want to do the same thing we did last time during the rehearsal, which is just flip it back between you and me one more time. Because for whatever reason, I'm not able to keep it in presentation mode. There you go. And then here we go again. Because, because, because. So again, it's not coming through. Okay, hopefully this works. Great, okay, so uh, thank you again for your patience. I'm Jay Udell, I'm a cardiologist at uh, Women's College Hospital and the Peter Monk Cardiac Center of Toronto General Hospital and, uh, and uh, assistant professor of medicine at University of Toronto. Um, it's my pleasure to present this. I hope it'll be a dynamic uh, uh, webinar on uh, influenza and heart disease. It was a real pleasure uh, that the Heart and Stroke had uh, asked me to give this talk, and you'll hear why I've had a little bit of an interest in this uh, uh, area for a little bit now, and uh, some ongoing, I think, hot uh, interest uh, in research in the field uh, where we can have, hopefully answer questions that are meaningful to patients and folks on the phone like yourselves. So part of this is going to be interactive, is going to be some polling questions I'm going to ask of, of you folks to try to do. So we're going to do a test run of that in a minute. You can see on this title slide how to go to either your mobile phone or onto the web in order to participate. So if you're if you're someone who prefers to text uh, to start to enter into the into the um, into the interactive process, you just want to text the number 37607. Uh, the, the word Udell, my name, uh, and then you'll be entered into the poll as it's going to start in a moment, or you can go to the website www.pollev.com and then just type as well in the, in the, in the address backslash Udell, and either one of those, once you enter, will allow you to get into the poll. So let's see if we can try one of these uh, just as a test question. So this one's, I promise you, an easy one. So uh, in 2017, 2018, I, uh, I got my flu shot. So if that's a yes, you want to answer with an A. No, answer with a B. Can't remember, answer with a C. I don't believe in flu shots, a D. I have an allergy to flu shots, so I can't get one, E. And as you can see here, jockeying for position. Clearly, if you're on this webinar, you're probably uh, more of a believer in flu shots already. So uh, I'm probably preaching to the choir, but you can see a healthy... Uh, minority of respondents here, about a third so far in this poll, um, and maybe even more, who didn't get a flu shot last year. And so part of what I'm hoping to do in the next hour um, or 40 minutes so that we leave plenty of time for questions is to try to convince uh, amongst those who may not have gotten a flu shot, there are various reasons why, uh, and whether or not I can convince you based on the data that is currently available or in, that is emerging, um, that there is benefits to a flu shot uh, in order to get one. So this is great, thank you. So it looks like the polling's working and we're getting a good healthy response. So in TV, we call this the cold open. So I want you to harken back to the year, it's 100 years ago this year, to the year of 1918, as you can see, the happy boys, some women as well, returning at the end of World War I uh, after a major battle had taken the lives of many, many people around the world. It was obviously a very uh, you know, tumultuous time in our history. And yet, while all of that focus and attention was on what was clearly one of the worst um, you know, battles and worst times in our, in our modern history, emerging from the, uh, a Spanish village uh, was this outbreak of what was now become clear was influenza that emerged in 1918 as well had three subsequent waves throughout 1919 and it was just devastating uh, not only was it devastating uh, where it started in Europe it quickly spread because of troops movements across both uh, the Atlantic the Pacific and across the North America um, continental it was quickly pandemic uh, it, it reached to the farthest places of the world. And, you know, we recognize that it was a, a respiratory illness. It was recognized that it was quite contagious. There was lots of historical, you know, photographs here taken of, of examples of what 
was being done in order at that time in order to minimize the risk. We had learned a lot then even about consumption or tuberculosis, about how to minimize the, the risk of contagion. You can see here an open air court proceeding happening on the right hand side in order to minimize risk. But you can also appreciate, particularly amongst the men, in my, in my humble opinion, the ignorant men, was the refusal at that time to wear what was being requested and being essentially mandated in certain uh, in jurisdictions and municipalities to wear a mask in order to reduce uh, further uh, the, the, the passing of influenza. And so it was actually, unfortunately, the recognition of the prevention had little effect. People at the prime of their lives were being infected. Uh, it was particularly lethal for those who were in middle age, unlike what we see maybe today in the seasonal flu as I'll walk through, but 500 million people worldwide or an estimated one third of the world's population were infected. It was one of those times, um, very interesting again, before even the, the right to vote, where women were, 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 were essentially um, stood, uh, you know, uh, stood up to the, to the task uh, including uh, during the war efforts to to move in, you see all of these very smart women here wearing their masks. Uh, we were there were lots of advertisements to train up to be a nurse, but it was a very again risky uh, proposition because of how high risk it was to and how easily it was to get to to spread the flu. And yet these women, these brave women, uh, throughout uh, developed and developing world stood uh, you know stood up to help. Uh, protect people and to go and do house-to-house uh, -house visits. In the end, it is approximated that 50 million people worldwide uh, were killed by influenza. Here's a, you know a, another a photograph here of, as you can see, all of the women here who were mandating you know the ambulances and also uh, were um, finding bodies on the street. It was a real scary time. 50,000 Canadians, we approximate, uh, um, succumbed to the flu over that course and period of time. And you'll see, you know, uh, every year in the media around this time, whether this could happen again. And there are, you know, calls by the CDC and around the world that it's suggested by the World Health Organization that we are due for a pandemic, you know, one, two or three every century. And that we've been really century free now since 1918. Is there better protection in 2018? And what does this have to do with heart disease, you might be asking? And so that's what I'm hoping to walk through with you today. And so for influenza itself and its effects potentially on the heart, what I'm hoping to walk through is to learn a little bit about the history, the risks and symptoms of influenza, review the burden of cardiovascular complications associated with flu, particularly for our older patients or those who are most vulnerable, evaluate, and I wanna show you some of the data for the effectiveness of a flu vaccine for prevention of influenza and cardiopulmonary complications, lung and heart complications, and discuss the evidence regarding more potent influenza vaccines for prevention of influenza and emerging data that might suggest there's a reduction in the risk of cardiopulmonary complications. So these are my disclosures. So we're grateful for the sponsorship of this webinar provided by Sanofi Pasteur, who manufactures flu vaccines. Uh, during my presentation, I'll be using generic names of products and we'll be discussing everything that's according to the guideline recommendations. And below that, of course, is my, uh, you know, other disclosures in terms of grant support, both by public and private agencies and relationships with commercial interests, uh, including other parts of Sanofi, the global company, uh, with regards to cardiovascular research. So fortunately, we know a lot more about influenza today than we did in 1918. So flu is a contagious respiratory illness caused by circulating seasonal influenza viruses. It can result in a range of illness, both mild illness as well as severe forms of illness, which can have major health and economic impact. Flu infections can result in major hospitalizations, particularly the heart and lung systems and fatalities, as I showed you in a dire example of the, of the Spanish flu in, in the turn of the century. Those who are most at risk are older patients, those who are pregnant, children, that should be pregnant comma children, not pregnant children, chronic conditions, uh, patients who have chronic conditions as a walkthrough, those are the patients who are at highest risk. And we do recommend that everyone six months of age and older receives an annual seasonal flu vaccine and that we're gonna walk through whether there's some personalization of that decision based on some data that certain you know, groups or certain patients, particularly age groups, may benefit from a, from a different type of vaccine than the standard vaccine. So if you remember nothing else from this presentation, that's really the take home message. I wanted to get that up right out of the bat. So impact of influenza in Canada and the United States, 
As you heard from Kirsten, on average, about 4,000 influenza-associated deaths can happen each season in Canada, about tenfold that in the United States. Over 20,000 influenza-related hospitalizations in Canada, 200,000 in the United States. Usually we see a greater number of hospitalizations and higher mortality during seasons when influenza type A, and particularly like last year, the H3N2 virus is the predominant strain. And that happened last year in the 2017-2018 season where we just had statistics come out. There was a nice article in the New York Times if you want to look up at the link uh, where 80,000 deaths were reported uh, in North America as a result of this virulent form. It was actually quite a virulent form compared to, you know, back to 2009 when we had a more mutated avian version of the flu. So what is peak flu season? So everyone knows that it's around the fall when we get the flu vaccine. So shown here is data from the last 30 years, 35 years from 1982 to 2018, where each month where the peak flu season was recorded has been given a, a number. And you can see that the peak flu activity is typically in February, but can range from as early as October. We're already seeing reports of patients presenting in Montreal and in Toronto uh, with uh, influenza symptoms that have tested positive for flu virus and can usually range up until the spring and usually in the late spring we start to see a B strain as the more predominant form and you can see sometimes a second wave of flu. In addition several other respiratory viruses are circulating and this will come into effect in terms of what you might be feeling in terms of symptoms we'll talk about that in a little bit and so the common cold flu uh, virus is called rhinovirus that can cause you know symptoms that can mimic flu as well as the respiratory syncytial virus or the RSV virus particularly can hurt both the, uh, those at extreme of age, the young, and as well those who are older than 65. So I get this question a lot. So um, is the flu a cold? Is the cold a flu? How can I tell them apart? So flu symptoms are certainly distinct from a cold. You will remember a flu uh, more so than the frequent times you've probably had a cold. So influenza is an abrupt on symptom onset virus, unlike a cold that is gradual. Fever is usually common, uh, usually lasts for three to four days, uh, though there are some patients with that asterisk that may not have a fever uh, who have flu. You have that classic chills, aches, and sweats that are common with influenza. Uh, and you know, lethargy, fatigue, really feeling run down. Cough and chest discomfort is common, and that discomfort can either be from uh, you know, the symptoms of a, of a pneumonia or bronchitis, particularly if there's also a secondary infection, can be quite severe, but it's not like the hacking cough that you might get or the mild or moderate symptoms of a cold. It is not common to have a lot of upper respiratory infect, uh, symptoms, so sneezing, the stuffy nose, the sore throat that's classic with a cold, typically not what you would see in flu. Certainly, it's way more severe than that. Headaches can be common, uh, unlike a, a common cold. And it's highly contagious. So people with flu can spread it to others up to six feet away. The, the virus spreads by droplets from coughing, sneezing, even talking, anywhere where the droplets land. And you can see here in the photograph that can be transmitted directly between like someone you speaking to you or leaving residue on, you know, uh, on surfaces, uh, straws is one example, uh, doorknobs, uh, you know, countertops. And so indirectly is the transmission as well or, or inhaled directly into the lungs. Typically symptom onset is within two days of, of being infected. And you're usually most contagious in those first three to four days. However, healthy adults can infect pay other people even up to one day before you actually feel symptoms and up to five to seven days after becoming sick. And as I mentioned, beyond fever, some infected carriers may not have any symptoms but can pass it on to others. So another reason why it may be important to protect yourself but also to protect others. So before I get into uh, the details, I'm curious what you folks think. So again, a poll question for you to ask, uh, to, to, to respond to. The worst thing about flu that you're aware of, text the answer or, or respond A, if you are sick for just a few days, B, it most impactful that you'll miss a few days at work and because you love to be at work, C, you might get your friends and family sick, or D, you can start off with flu and it develops into pneumonia or worse. And there obviously may be more than one correct answer here, but I'm curious what you think is uh, you know, the most important answer for you. And so we can see here a jockeying of responses here. 
um, where, where we have a, a pretty healthy, uh, you know, right now distribution between you potentially coming, uh, getting more than just a, a respiratory infection, but developing some severe complications, as well as the concern that you might be a vector to infect friends and family. Great. So absolutely, influenza can lead to devastating complications, particularly at risk or patients and adults who are 65 years and older, and we'll talk about why in a few slides. It can lead to a superimposed infection of a bacteria called pneumococcus and a pneumonia that can kill more than 18,000 older adults in the United States each year. So this is a beautiful info slide that the um, National Foundation of, Inf of uh, Infectious Diseases uh, produces every year a version of this. Um, I'm going to show you some data where in the first two weeks of an infection, your risk of a heart attack is increased by three to five fold and in a risk of stroke by two to three fold. Stroke in a patient with influenza, you wouldn't think that those two would necessarily be related, but it's a serious potential complication. But so are just flu-related hospitalizations in general. So those who are 65 years and older represent 78% by according to this data in the 2014-2015 season. I'll show you some other data in a moment. And in general, those who are 65 years and older are six times more likely to die from flu compared to the other age groups. So let's walk through some of that data. So this is data reported by the CDC from last year's flu season. I'm showing you here on the x-axis here on the long the horizontal line the uh, timing of the year. So we start flu season off in the fall of 2017 into the spring of 2018 as well as the hospitalization rate along the vertical axis. So you can see here a, a, a several differences in, in rates here but per 100,000 patients of follow-up showing you different uh, on the far right hand side the legend for the green bar there represents those patients or those adults individuals 65 years and older don't forget those who are even just modestly of average middle age 50 to 64 then our youngest patients those who are up to four years of age then those who are at the prime of their lives 18 to 50 and then those who are at 5 to 17 so young and adolescent you can see that the uh, people 65 years and older last year suffered the clearest highest burden of hospitalizations overall related to flu. flu lab, these are lab confirmed flu hospitalizations as it's written over there at the top of the, of the panel. And that's sixfold more than the, the next all the age groups combined. So as mentioned in that infographic, the highest rates of flu related hospitalizations, they're borne by those who are 65 years and older. And, the, and that again, dying from flu, 70 to 85% of deaths are those among 65 years and older. However, we shouldn't neglect the impact in younger patients, particularly those with chronic conditions or women who are pregnant. It can still be very impactful, even data that was reported yesterday that came out uh, about women who are pregnant that can be protected from a flu vaccine. So what are those risk factors? So here shown here is a typical flu season. The highest comorbidities recorded amongst those who were hospitalized with flu. And you can see along the, again, the horizontal, that of almost 50% of people hospitalized are presenting with obesity. We could argue that that's representative of North American population, but that's higher than the typical hospitalization rate for other reasons um, that we see outside of flu season, as well as metabolic disorders, particularly diabetes, over 30% of patients hospitalized. Heart disease and stroke, again, representing about 30% of our patients, then those with chronic lung conditions, asthma, bronchitis, emphysema. And note those women who are pregnant represent over 20% of patients hospitalized each season with flu. And then people who have a chronic immune suppression, either with from um, cancer, steroids, um, therapy, those can cause, uh, again, a good uh, almost 18%. Uh, uh, neurological conditions, kidney disease, et cetera. And then there are still about 15% of people who have no known conditions, not medical conditions, but we know that there are certain groups that are particularly high risk sociodemographic groups, including our Aboriginal community and those who have no fixed address uh, and living uh, without a home. And so those patients are particularly also at risk because of sometimes tight quarters and that increased risk for contagious virus spreading. 
So there have been some epidemiological studies. We can talk about uh, observational studies a lot and how there may be some that are prone to some, uh, you know, not measuring some potential confounding effects. So I like to look at these types of studies that really try to minimize to the extent possible uh, other outside influences. So we talk about the observational study here, a self-controlled case series analysis. That's a big, you know, chunk of words. So let me just walk you through what we're talking about here. We can follow people. And that's what we can do with some of our surveillance studies that and Liam Smith and his team did back about 20 years ago now. And you can see here that this is a surveillance period outside of flu or flu-like illness symptom timings. And then when for people first report to their GP or their or to an emergency room with a flu-like illness, we can start the clock and follow you up to see whether or not there's any increase activity for cardiovascular complications. And then after a while, reset the clock back to your baseline and some arbitrary period of time. And then again, the same patient may show up a different season or the, or, or the same season with another flu-like illness and follow them up again. So we're looking for respiratory infections, flu-like illness, and looking for observations with increased activity for hospitalizations for cardiovascular events and using people as their own self-control so that we minimize differences between people who might have other, you know, as I mentioned, sociodemographic or other conditions that put them at risk and that we can't really understand without randomized uh, trials. Of course, we're never gonna randomize people to flu vaccine, to flu virus or no flu virus. And what his colleagues showed in the seminal paper in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine 2004, looking at 20,000 first heart attacks or 19,000 first strokes, that within the first three days of reporting an influenza-like illness or respiratory infection, there was a five-fold spike in patients being hospitalized with a heart attack that persisted up to two weeks out to still three-fold. So that's where that infographic gets a three to five-fold increased risk. And that your risk really only regresses to baseline after about three months out of having an influenza-like illness. A little bit attenuated, but still an increase in three-fold risk of stroke that it's still persistent to about two-fold increased risk up to two weeks out of having an influenza-like illness that regresses to baseline after three months. I also showed you data for flu vaccine, not because I'm trying to convince you that the flu vaccine in this study was protective. You know, there's actually Y constant rules. This is essentially a null effect. You can consider this a control just to show you that vaccines don't increase anybody's risk of showing up with a heart attack or a stroke, just to give you some examples of that. There was some uh, very exciting research that came out of our own uh, Institute of Clinical Evaluative Sciences and my colleague Jeffrey Kwong just last year. It was published this spring in the New England Journal of Medicine that did a similar study, did same kind of observational analysis, but now he was very fortunate. He had worked really hard to, to, to corral all of the different lab confirmed flu cases we had in Ontario. So this isn't just some doctors, you know, got instinct of whether the symptoms looked like. We actually knew the difference between what the virus was, whether it was flu, whether it was some other respiratory infection virus, a bacterial infection, what have you, and did the same kind of analysis using this potential window starting at seven days to see if there's any increased activity after a flu has been detected, somebody presenting to the family doctor, going to the emergency room and having your nose swabbed and it had been confirmed by public health, and whether there was an increased risk for cardiac events. And so what Jeff found was that there was actually a change in activity that in the background is usually a heart attack hospitalization rate of about three per week in, in Ontario to 20 a week during a, after the first week after a flu infection amongst these 300 so on hospitalizations that he had lab confirmed flu diagnosis. That translated in the first seven days to a six times increased risk from influenza being hospitalized with a heart attack but in this study, again, that lasted seven days and that by that point, it regressed back down to a, to a null effect. There was no increased activity after seven days. This was in a consistent effect, either with the vaccine, be, uh, the virus being confirmed as influenza A, and even more so if the virus was influenza B. So the coverage against a B strain we're gonna get into seems to be just as important. And remember those other viruses that are circulating, as I mentioned, during flu season, RSV also increases your risk. Other respiratory viruses also increase your risk about threefold. And any other type of respiratory infection for that point, threefold. But influenza seems to be keenly accentuate that risk. And so again, if I can emphasize how important it is, if there was a way to, uh, to protect people against influenza, even if it's not 100% efficient, 
there is a chance here that we might be able to reduce your risk for heart disease, at least a particularly a trigger of a heart attack. So is there real evidence to support this? Is there actual you know, uh, biological mechanistic effects? So yeah, so we see that influenza as practicing clinicians, as a cardiologist, we see that it can result in heart inflammation. That term clinically is called myocarditis. I'm showing you here some histological pictures of, of, of actual immune response in the blue uh, to an infection infiltrating heart muscle in a patient who had to have their heart muscle taken out because they were so sick that they ended up needing a heart transplant. You can see this infiltration of this inflammatory cells, there's swelling or interstitial edema, and then there's destruction of the heart tissue called cardiac necrosis. 10% of patients can be infected with influenza can present with this case, but that's probably just representing the tip of the iceberg. Usually most cases are mild and resolve spontaneously. We're not typically getting a sample of heart tissue in every patient showing up with flu. So we're not even sure how often this is happening, but we have a sense that if these are the sickest patients, that even in those you know, mild cases, there may be involvement as well. There's also the concept of the indirect stressor of influenza on the system. So this is a you know a cartoon that shows you all the different systems that might be involved with it, you know an influenza or respiratory pneumonia type of infection. It can impair your ability to exchange oxygen, and your breathing can get worse. It can impair your ability to manage your fluids and salt levels, and your kidneys can get worse. It can cause stress and cause changes in your blood pressure, high or low, cause a stress response on your coronary arteries, and add an extra burden to your heart, your lungs, your kidneys that can eventually culminate in heart failure or potentially fatal heart rhythms. Sometimes the medicines we use, including antibiotics, can be actually pro-arrhythmic, even though an antibiotic won't work on a flu virus. And so again, there's many different mechanisms you can imagine then a patient who's already predisposed, who has a chronic condition, may not have as much reserve um, than those who are otherwise healthy and why patients who are older or patients with chronic conditions might even be more susceptible. So before we get into like therapies, everyday preventative actions can protect against the flu. So you can prevent the spread of flu from some common sense preventative means. And we talk about sometimes the three C's. So you can avoid contact with sick people. So you see sometimes around flu season, folks who feel that they have symptoms are wearing a mask or uh, you can stay home, which you know is again hard for us that a lot of people take a lot of pride in their work, feel that and appropriately so that they're instrumental to the day-to-day -day activities, but it's important to you know respect that you're gonna be potentially sick and just run down, let alone contagious to others. Wash your hands frequently with soap and water and disinfect surfaces that you might have touched if you haven't had a chance to wash your hands before you sneezed or coughed or touched something. And speaking of which, avoid touching your eyes, your nose and mouth as germs spread that way. You can you know actually give yourself the, the flu if you touch something and then you rub your eyes. And so in part of those three C's, includes covering your mouth or coughing away from people, coughing into the, into the elbow uh, of, of your, and not onto your sleeve in order to minimize the risk uh, of, of, of spreading contagious flu. And then of course, to discard of any of those tissues as soon as possible. Those are everyday common mechanisms. But fall is the time to get your flu shot because the sooner you get it, the sooner you're protected. So again, before I get into the details, if I can just, again, get a poll here. If I get a flu shot in 2018 this year, it's going to be because of the following. So text A, if it's going to protect you from the flu. B, protect others from the flu. C, make my job makes me do it. That's why I'm going to go get the flu this year. D, my spouse makes me do it. You know, I wouldn't do it alone, but I got someone looking after me. Or E, because I'm going to protect myself. You know, you already showed me some of that data. If I'll believe it when I see it, but maybe the flu vaccine can also protect me from some of those pneumonias or getting a heart attack. So again, we're getting a good healthy jockeying of responses here. I like that there's a nice 50-50 distribution here between protecting me and protecting others. But you know, there are certain occupations, including my own, and 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 as you may hear, you know, nurses and other folks who work in, in the hospitals where the jobs make you do it, because again, you're someone who's treating vulnerable patients. Um, and it's not surprising that some people do it because it's part of their expected occupation uh, uh, protection. Um, so um, good to see that uh, everyone either has been making decisions on their own, unlike me, who, who sometimes have to do it because their spouse has to do it. But I, I have a very well-meaning spouse, of course. 
So with a good match, the seasonal flu vaccine can be up to 70%, maybe even better effective in healthy recipients for preventing flu. Last year, it was about 40% effective. Uh, so it wasn't 0% effective, but of course, we're always hoping, we always think about vaccines as all or nothing, like a polio shot or something against you know, um, uh, um, diphtheria uh, or other vaccines. So 40% isn't bad. We'll show you what that might translate to in a moment. But particularly those who are 65 years and older, a flu vaccine can decrease your incidence or risk of getting pneumonia, uh, cardiovascular events, those heart attacks or congestive heart failure, and hospitalizations from all causes. And I'll walk you through some of that data. So again, this was a small clinical trial, but a seminal study by Kristen Nickel and her colleagues, again, 1995, again, uh, 20 plus years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, where they took healthy adults, these aren't even those who are most, uh, who are 65 years and older, vaccinated them to either placebo or a flu shot. You could still do placebo controlled trials back then. There was still considered a balance of whether it was actually going to really result in benefit in those who are not 65. And you can see in the light blue, who are the placebo, had a rate of the number of patient days. So an upper respiratory tract illness or URTI, there was about 10 days if you didn't get the flu shot. And that reduced it to about eight days if you did get the flu shot. Sick leave days also reduced. Sick leave specifically for a bronchitis or respiratory tract infection or family medicine visits in general. And these were all coming around 20 to 40% risk reduction that were highly statistically significant for these, again, really healthy adults out there, about 850 patients. There were no, at that point, uh, it wasn't considered uh, proper to do a placebo controlled trial. So these were observational studies of non recipients compared to flu recipients in those who were 65 years in age and older. And she did it over three different flu seasons 1990, 1991, and 1992. And you can see here reductions in the rates of hospitalization for pneumonia or influenza from 6% to 2.5% in one year, a virulent year of 91 from 11 to 5%, 8 to 4%, translating to a risk reduction somewhere between 50%, 40 to 57% each year strongly significant. And there was a hint in her early work that it might reduce heart failure. So again, each year there might have been a trend in 1990-91, it became significant in 1991-92 year, that virulent year where it was really a third of risk reduction uh, that was statistically significant. The 92-93 years, you can see that wasn't a very powerful flu year. Those who were non-recipients in the light blue in 92 had the same risk as the flu recipients in the year before. And so that year it wasn't different. And it, but it does open the question that maybe a flu shot, if we actually did some rigorous clinical trial work, might actually translate into cardiac protection. So while I was a fellow, we were seeing some small randomized trials that had attempted to address this question. Each individually were underpowered looking at heart patients or looking at patients with heart disease in some other form. So I undertook with my colleagues a systematic review and we put together the evidence to see whether or not a flu vaccine in patients with a history of heart disease could result in a reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events or what we call a MACE. So we looked at different types of MACE. We looked at heart uh, attacks. We looked at dying from heart disease or cardiovascular death, stroke, heart failure, presenting with an uh, unstable angina to the emergency room or requiring an urgent coronary angioplasty. There were, as you can see here, five different trials that looked at the question. And we had uh, some data up to about, about 6,500 patients that were studied and about 200 events between uh, flu vaccine patients or those who either got a placebo vaccine or got the standard of care. And as you can see here on this forest plot, anything to the left of the forest plot here shows that influenza vaccine is better. Anything to the right suggests that placebo control was better. That influenza vaccine recipients who were randomized now, so this is in observational studies, had about a 30%, 36% risk reduction um, that was highly statistically significant for protection against heart attacks or other major adverse events, including dying from heart disease in the next year after receiving the flu shot. That absolute risk difference was approximately 2%, and that translates into a number of patients that I need to vaccinate uh, to prevent one major adverse event of about 58 patients. So that's pretty good uh, in terms of our uh, therapies that we have out there. 
we had a hypothesis that those who were at highest risk uh, for heart recurrent heart events, those who had had a recent heart attack or an acute coronary syndrome, would be the most potentially likely to benefit from a flu vaccine. So in those trials, there were actually some patients who were included after a heart attack, some who had just had an angioplasty without actually having heart events. You can see heart attack patients in general in the placebo group, 23% risk overall in the next year of one of those major adverse cardiovascular events that reduced the 10%, which results in a 50% risk reduction that was highly statistically significant. That is a number needed to treat of almost 13%, or in other words, a number needed to vaccinate of eight patients. Eight patients are the amount of patients I see a day when we're on call at Toronto General Hospital. Vaccinate all eight of them, and one of them will have prevented a heart event in the next year. Pretty good um, uh, numbers. So problem solved, right? then why are so many people foregoing a flu vaccine and why is it so ineffective? We have very low rates of seasonal influenza vaccination in our country. 36% of Canadians reported influenza vaccination, only 37% amongst 18 to 64, and that's with people with a chronic condition as shown here in the light blue compared to those who don't have it in red across the different age groups. 53%, only half of our healthcare providers. We're doing better amongst patients who are 65 years and older, approaching 70%. But the, app, but the goal line, at least for Canada, is an 80% target, and we're just barely reaching that in the oldest of the old patients in the 85 and older, those who have a sec, you know, at least one chronic condition. So I think we can do better. What's your excuse? 60% of Americans, when asked by this Harris poll that was produced for Target, would skip getting their flu vaccine. Most people just think they don't need it. They're impervious to flu. Some folks are fearful of a flu-related, you know, a vaccine-related illness. I think, um, as I showed you already data, that is just not reasonable, just not actually happening. 23% are afraid of needles. 18% think it's too expensive. Of course, in the United States, less so in Canada, it's not, you know, as much publicly covered. And then there are other reasons. You know, people would skip their household. They would rather, you know, even with children, skip it. Uh, compared to people who don't have uh, children. Adults would rather prepare their tax returns or do some other unpleasant activity than get a flu shot, and 13% of people, and 26% of men would choose to do household chores like laundry or washing dishes to get out of getting a flu shot. Pretty surprising. How does the flu vaccine work? I'm showing you here a cartoon just to show you that we have, you'll hear sometimes about your flu vaccines or the flu that circulates. There's the A strains or B strains, where they come from, and then a little bit about the subtype, as I mentioned, H1N1 and H3N2 are pretty virulent strains. Most vaccines are inactivated dead flu vaccine product, dead flu product that the vaccine then gets an immune response from. There is an intranasal attenuated live vaccine of weakened or a pulverized virus, but we recommend that that's usually restricted to uh, young children. Uh, uh, certainly to avoid if those with chronic conditions or immune suppression, you can't use it if your immune is, uh, system is weakened. The virus mutates we, uh, frequently, and so that's why virus strains are updated every year. Uh, we usually have a three-strain vaccine against at least two A strains and one B strain, or a four-strain vaccine, which covers a second B strain. And immunity wanes over a year, so annual vaccine boost protection. It's a vaccine effectiveness. It usually you get immunity within two weeks after vaccination. Healthy adults, as I mentioned, can get up to 80% protection in a good match year, but those who are 65 years and older or have those, again, chronic comorbidities may have a lower immune uh, response or what we call immunosenescence, and why we're always looking for better vaccines that can boost the immune system. I'm showing you here some classic data that as you go from left to right, you're seeing a more robust immune response. The higher the titers, the lower your risk for infection in this classic study from the 70s. So are any of the available flu vaccines recommended over the others? Before I get into the hard and details, I just would like to pull the, the, the group again. So answer A, no, there are no vaccines that are recommended over the others. B, yes, or C, it depends. Maybe it depends on your age, maybe it depends on uh, where you live, maybe it depends on chronic conditions. And so you can see here, we got a healthy balance here between the yeses and the noes. And usually on a multiple choice question, if you've ever had to do it like I do many, uh, it depends is usually a safe answer. 
So absolutely, there's a variety of vaccine preparations out there. And particularly when we're talking about people 65 years and older, there are certain vaccines that are being suggested over the others with data to support that. So there's a high dose vaccine that contains four times more antigen, more dead flu uh, product than the standard dose vaccines. And there's these adjuvant vaccines as well. Um, adjuvant vaccines contain ingredients that help to boost the immune system. Though, at least, again, the United States in particular, the CDC recommend don't delay. It's so, of course, if you can get one of these two types of product that may be more in, uh, you know, recommended in that age group, fantastic, but it's important to get your flu shot. And so it's also important to get it as early as possible. So don't delay getting one over the other um, if it's going to be a substantial time difference. So what is a high dose flu vaccine compared to a standard dose flu vaccine? I mentioned this before. So the standard dose in the top left-hand corner here of the table contains two A strains and one B strain. A high dose version on the right-hand side has four times more of the product from 15 to 60 micrograms approved for people 65 years of age and older. A standard quadrivalent vaccine, so again, back to that same dose of 15, can cover an additional B strain. So now we're covering four strains and there is no, in the bottom right-hand corner, formulation of high-dose quadrivalent just yet, though I understand that some are in the works. So there was some rigorous studies of these, of these products, particularly the high-dose uh, trivalent vaccine was studied compared to the standard dose tri trivalent vaccine in about 32,000 patients during two flu seasons. And this paper, again, published in 2014, where they followed patients up for during the flu season out until the spring and looked to see for any uh, influenza confirmed illness, so lab confirmed flu. And you can see that uh, high dose compared to standard dose trivalent vaccine reduced the risk of an influenza like illness about 24%. Again, low absolute rates, but this was a pretty rigorous um, endpoint to achieve. That it, um, There was also pneumonia that was much more prevalent, reduced from 14 to 10%, so about a 30% risk reduction. And although it wasn't statistically significant, it was an impressive trend in the right direction that any cardiorespiratory illness was reduced by 30% uh, as well. Hospitalizations overall were trending in the right direction, but not statistically significant. There were low rates of, of death in this study, uh, and, but certainly no higher risk of death uh, with the high-dose vaccine. So very promising uh, findings, pretty rigorous evaluation with a big 32,000 patient trial, which also gives us a lot of really robust information about safety. So the high-dose vaccine, you know, it's boosting your immune response. So you know it's working when you get a little bit more injection site pain and redness erythema at the spot where you got your infection. You might see a little bit more muscle aches and pains, a little bit more malaise, um, a little bit more headache, but we're not talking a substantially uh, larger effect here. And again, I usually tell my patients that's how you know you're gonna get a good immune response. So certainly a little bit increased, but we're not talking two, three, four times increase, we're talking just a little bit increase. Particularly you know, concerning side effects, those that could react to the immune system, that could react with the nervous system or, or very rare. In this 32,000 patient trial, there was just a handful of events, none that were increased in those with the high dose. So none of those scary side effects. There's increasingly new data coming out. So now there's this recombinant flu vaccine. It's not approved yet for use in Canada, but it is so in the United States where they're taking the DNA of the flu the, uh, and actually you know, using that to make a flu vaccine. And they're not even doing it in eggs anymore. They're doing it in cells. And they did a big trial of that vaccine against the quadrivalent, so four strains of the inactivated flu vaccine, a standard dose one. And you can see here that, again, on the relative vaccine efficacy scale, the vaccine efficacy on the right-hand side shows that the new recombinant vaccine was better than just the standard vaccine. So we probably will be seeing vaccines like this coming in the next few years. It was fairly consistent, although this may not be statistically you know, across the, the line. It was a consistent effect across both age groups. For PCR confirmed flu, that's a pretty rigorous standard, but for culture positive flu, again, the age groups again had a, a, a consistent benefit. It definitely may be something different here between A and B strains that may not cover B strains so well, so I think there's more work to be done there, but you can see that uh, very promising research being done in the field. And so what do the guidelines say in Canada? The guidelines show you that uh, an inactivated flu vaccine that covers three, so the trivalent flu vaccine, particularly for middle-aged adults, 
or the quadrivalent vaccine or these uh, as ex these nasal sprays are rec are potentially preferred vaccines, but certainly not the nasal spray in immunocompromised patients. As we get older, the immunocompromised uh, the the attenuates rate we don't use it at all. It's dropped at all, and so for ages 60 to 65 for uh, either the trivalent standard dose or the quadrivalent standard dose. And as people get older at 65 years of age, the high dose one that boosts the immune system that has been shown now to also benefit hard endpoints of flu and pneumonia is recommended for individuals. So you'll see that recommendation in our guidelines. From a program perspective, each province, is, they didn't mandate that in Canada this year. So in terms of what the pro provinces do, but if you have the option at the individual level, it is the recommended option. Uh, adjuvant vaccine, I might mention, is also an alternative there, and there are some provinces that are offering that as a walkthrough in a minute. What do the Americans say? So high-dose uh, flu vaccine, uh, standard-dose flu vaccine, trivalent, quadrivalent, adjuvant or non-adjuvanted, or that new recombinant one, they're all potentially useful in those who are 65 years and older. And although they acknowledge that large RCCT may provide better protection, they want to emphasize that it's just important to get your flu shot. So something is better than nothing, and don't delay if appropriate flu vaccine is already available uh, in front of you when you're given the opportunity. So just to wrap up, which vaccines are publicly covered across Canada? So for public coverage, you can see here that most provinces across Canada provide some for version of a universal vaccine coverage, at least of a standard dose vaccine, typically the quadrivalent. Um, that uh, adults 65 years and older are universally covered in addition in BC and in New Brunswick. And in Quebec, it's limited to those who are 75 years of age or older or residents of long-term care facilities or those who have a chronic condition for universal public coverage. But that's when we finally get it blanketed across the country. What about for people 65 years and older in terms of preferential vaccine? So the high-dose trivalent vaccine in Ontario is available. You can't get it for public coverage from your local pharmacy, but you can get it from your primary care provider, um, as well as you can probably find it in private insurance as well, if you ask. Uh, there are other provinces across the country here, shown here, that will provide it for those who are living in certain uh, long-term care facilities or other kind of you know, supervised housing, uh, again, uh, shown here. And that adjuvant vaccine is available uh, in Quebec and Newfoundland for, again, for ad older adults, or living in a long-term care facility. So to wrap up, if the highest risk patients derive the least amount of benefit, as I showed you the data from a standard flu shot, which may be cardioprotective, maybe we need a definitive outcomes trial to sort this out. It's very few head-to-head -head trials of flu vaccines out there. And so which strategy may be superior, particularly for our highest risk patients? So uh, our team in Toronto and with colleagues across uh, North America are working on that. We got a clinical trial we call Invested, which is funded by the United States National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, where we're randomizing patients who've had a heart attack or a heart failure hospitalization and one additional risk factor to either in a double blind fashion, the high dose trivalent vaccine or the standard dose quadrivalent vaccine in a really pragmatic way, following people up over four flu seasons, over 9,000 patients, looking to see if it actually a flu shot and more potent and more maybe um, directed flu shot will reduce dying or being hospitalized for a heart or lung condition. So we hope to have more information for you in the next year or two when that the trial results are completed. If you're interested to hear more or potentially to be participate either as a patient or as a clinician, please come to our website, investedtrial.org. And with that, just to wrap up, influenza is a contagious respiratory illness with a range of mild to severe illness. Uh, cardiopulmonary hospitalization or deaths can occur. Older patients, those who are women with pregnancy, children, or those who with chronic conditions are the highest risk. Everyday prevention with good hygiene and precautions can reduce that risk. Flu vaccines are safe. Uh, there may be other respiratory viruses circulating, but it's not the reason when you come down with the, some symptoms after a virus that you got it from the vaccine. could be something else. It's a very effective at reducing pneumonia and potentially cardiac hospitalizations. More potent vaccines, including high-dose vaccine, can further boost the immunity, reduce risk of influenza illness, and we're working on ongoing research, hopefully, to answer further questions about cardioprotection. With that, I'd leave you with one last poll question, then we'd like to open the floor for some questions. 
that this year I plan to get a flu shot. So compared to what we saw before in terms of, you know, the entering, in terms of what we saw last year, I, I, I see that, that I may have convinced that, you know, uh, majority, there is still a healthy minority that has not been convinced yet, but we got maybe a conversion from no's to maybe's. So I appreciate your attention. I hope that we can open the floor for a few questions. Sorry if I went a little late, but I hope that uh, this information was helpful. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Udell. We've got a couple questions already in. Um, the first one comes from a caregiver and is looking for a little bit of advice in terms of um, what you could recommend to them when their loved one living with heart disease won't get a shot. So what, ki what kind of recommendation could you give to that particular caregiver? That's a tough one. You know, people still have entitled, you know, to make a decision about their own health. So, you know, uh, encouragement, support, you know, just like I treat with my patients in my clinic, it's the best you can do. Maybe have them watch the webinar if they think that that might be of value. Um, be, be, feel free to reach out. I can be happy to share any information that they have. A conversation with the care provider as well as the loved one is always important. Um, and hopefully there, there's a shared decision making. Now, frankly, if they just say no, but they start to come down with flu-like illness, there are some post-illness uh, treatments that you can take in the first 48 hours, these anti-flu therapies, these drugs, like Tamiflu is an example. That, but you have to get it in early within the first 48 hours of symptoms for them to help, you know, mitigate some of the effects. But it doesn't just make them go away. And, and it's not a, it's just like a flu shot. It's not 100 percent, you know, effective. And so we always advocate for doing as much as you can to prevent. I certainly would also think about those common sense uh, recommendations, wearing a mask, staying away from infected people uh, and using common sense in terms of hand washing and hygiene. Great. And next question. Do you have any advice on how to respond to someone that the flu shot contains harmful additives? Very good question. So I just want to reassure those folks who are out there that are worried about that. Now, there are certainly a preservative in multi-use vaccines that come in the standard dose. There are that they come in the packages where you can draw out of them 10 or 20 shots at a time that do use a preservative that some folks are concerned about when they read about it. I'll grant you that, and if you don't want that, there should be an alternative out there that are what called single-use vaccines that are packaged that way, that typically you should be able to get access to, and that don't contain the preservative, and that shouldn't have any concerns with regards to any kind of quote-unquote ingredients that can cause harm. But on the majority, even that preservative hasn't been shown in the millions of people that get a flu shot every year to have any clear association with the concerns that people have that and that we hear about and it's perpetuated on online and in, in blogs and in reports. So I want to emphasize that there is no data to support it. But if you really feel strongly about it, there are alternative options and that foregoing a flu shot is the most risky thing. And so although there are people out there that don't believe in vaccines, if you're open to this webinar and you're open to a flu shot, there are alternatives out there that can ensure that you are not getting a preservative. Thanks, Dr. Dell. I think that's a good point for us to end on. Um, so I'm just going to bring up this last slide as a final note to encourage people who uh, have joined us who may be living with heart disease or stroke or caring for those who have heart disease or stroke um, to check out our community of survivors and our um, caregivers community, our members only Facebook groups. If you'd like to get more information from us, you can join our e-register or subscribe to that. And if you'd like more information about the invested trial that Dr. Udell mentioned, um, just to reiterate the URL, it's investedtrial.org right there. Um, if people have more questions, please feel free to send them to Heart and Stroke Health Presents at heartandstroke.ca. Sometimes something may occur to you after the fact, and we would be happy to forward those on. Um, and as I mentioned, this recording will be made available after after the fact as well. So I hope that you will share the message and thank you for your time. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you.